Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. Offplanetradio.com. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. And uh, today's show is it's a conversation between somebody that I'm um, getting to know and comes out of a, I'll just say it up front, this comes out of a, a bit of a controversy. I said it right this time, Emily. I didn't say controversy. She says, I put the, the syllable on the wrong, I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, but uh, we got that right. And uh, we're going to, we're going to kick around a whole bunch of fascinating topics today with my guest from Liverpool, the UK, Great Britain, uh, England, <laughs> Darren Williams, welcome to Off Planet Radio, my brother. Thanks very much for having me. I'm a long time fan of your work. Um, I've been particularly inspired by it, directly by a superb interview you had with um, a very rare person, a person of great humanity called Kerry Budmore, I believe you spoke Sister Kerry Burner, yes. And that touched me. Oh. It was more than just alternative research. It was about just somebody trying to overcome injustice. And it greatly inspired me in a positive way in my own personal life, but also as an alternative researcher. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, that was an interview that got real emotional with me for a lot of reasons. And people who go back and listen to that, I, I, I struggled through that interview because I understand what TIs go through. I've experienced it. I'm still experiencing it. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that. So the, you and your background, and those who are watching the show and follow Robert Phoenix's work will obviously recognize Darren. He's been on with Robert a number of times, I guess. And we sort of came together in an interesting fashion on Twitter, didn't we, Darren? We did indeed. One of the things I try to do is I try to... There's two types of um, things going on within alternative research. I watched a film recently called John Wick 3, and the whole notion of that film is about the high table and then what goes on the underneath the table. As It's a metaphor, so to speak. So the rulers of the assassins, the governing body, the worldwide union, they sit at the table and everybody else is beneath them, underneath getting their scraps. So what we have within the alternative research community, we have well-known names um, that sit on the table, David Icke, Alex Jones, etc. And then we have other people underneath. And what I try to do, I'm one of those people underneath who hasn't got a website who isn't interested in starting their own podcast at this moment in time, who doesn't have a blog, but just goes on social media, pays attention to alternative research and researchers. And what I try to do is I try to reach out to the big names, but also reach out to people who are just very interested in alternative research, who, like me, might put some very thought-provoking ideas, evidence, data, speculation online, but also maybe not that well-known alternative researchers, because the thing that we have, sadly, within alternative research, we have a top table and we have a low table, and people have to get out of that paradigm. Everybody should be valued for what they bring to the conversation rather than how many followers or how many books or how many mainstream articles have been made about them. So this is what I try to do. I try to connect and bring the true 
ethos of what I believe alternative research should be about? Well, as we all know, I'm certainly not at the high table. And that's after doing this show for 10 years. Uh, never set out to be famous, never set out to really be anything other than an authentic voice for what I believe and how I started out. And the pecking order in alternative media is interesting because, yeah, you have people who are essentially the gatekeepers, the, the ones that sit in the chair, the ones who are clearly harvesting the rewards of what they do career-wise, and, and they're basically set up. And uh, people like Alex Jones, I encountered Alex Jones when I went online in 2003. I encountered Alex Jones when I was on a shortwave radio network, which ran for um, about four years. So, and he's just, you know, he's just one of the people that's out there. You know, I take Alex this way. Alex, in one sense, opened up people's channels to be able to receive certain truths. He told certain truths. And then some of it's loaded with a fair amount of disinformation, misinformation, COINTELPRO. Those are all aspects of media that the average person doesn't have the ability to sift through unless, you know, they've been in it a long time. So... I look at the alternative media as being, by extension, the audience. The audience is more important than the host. The people who come on the show and speak to the audience and speak to the truth that the audience wants to receive are far more important to me than even what I actually have to say. My goal is to shape a conversation in such a way that people like yourself can step out of the, what you would call the audience level and become participants. In, and this is what media was supposed to be. It was supposed to be the public's medium. And over the last, I'll say, certainly the last six or seven years, we've seen the professionalization of it. We've seen how it's been taken over. And we see how it's been manipulated and controlled and intercepted and used by, by intelligence agency operatives inside of it. So, you know, the message continues. However, many hundreds or thousands of people hear and see what we do. We put the message out there because by doing that, we're extending ourselves energetically into this electronic medium. So, there's, sorry, sister, there's one, I won't name this host, but there's one host of a very well-known platform and I have asked repeatedly to be a guest on their platform because I think I have now a body of work where I've been on various other people's podcasts and I'm well known within the alternative research community. Yep. And this individual always blocks me, always refuses. And I believe the reason why is I'm not selling anything. So what it is there, if I was selling a product, then I would have to be have a, have a conversation that might not go into confrontation. But because I have nothing to sell, if that host said something that I disagreed with, I could then get into an argument with them. And that's where it is. If, it, if it's mutually beneficial, that's what that host wants. But I can't give him an audience because I don't have a website or I'm, I don't have a number of books. So this is the interesting thing about where alternative research now comes into, um, I want Patreons, I need PayPal donations, I need this. Obviously, it is nice to receive these things, but I look at Buddhism as an example. And just before Buddha died, his followers said to him, what is the meaning of life? Should we kill the rich? Should we give all our belongings away? And his response was, enlighten people without the need for reward. Holy crap, and you just you just nutshelled what is essentially going to be our entire conversation today. That's awesome. And that is what I believe that you should do as an individual. If yeah. you do that, that, that is what it is. Because if we're in the alternative um, research community, we must believe that there is another side to, an ex to this existence, that there is more to the world that we can see. 
So therefore, once we leave this mortal coil, then we go somewhere else. So we, so where do we go? So the best thing to be, in a basic way, is be a good person. Yep. That's it. That's all you have at the end of the day. So let's, let's launch into this. You and, I, you and I have been connected on Twitter. Twitter is a platform that I'm really in my infancy using. I've had a Twitter account since mm, 2012 probably. Not used it a whole lot. Don't, still don't understand it completely. But I, I've, I've also come to realize there's a certain economy there and a certain value in terms of how Twitter operates in that these are very rapid, it's a very rapid messaging system with media attachments. And it allows you to put out, I'll call them thought pulses, the ability to nutshell something and cram it into, what is it, 256 characters or something, whatever the limit is now on Twitter. It was... It's 140, and now I think it's 235 or 236. Yeah, it, it originally started out, it was basically the equivalent of a text messaging system. And the platform's kind of evolved over time. It's not perfect. It's got its own issues. But unlike Facebook, it's very rapid fire, and it's, it's a way to communicate in a, in, a, in a different context electronically. So... How you and I came to do this interview largely has to do with a tweet that I put out. That tweet was deleted, and that was deleted because you were kind enough, brave enough to take exception to something that I said in that tweet. Maybe you remember that tweet better than I do. Can you want to summarize that for us, Darren? Um, I, just to let everyone know, I have dyslexia. And one of the gifts and curses of dyslexia is that people like me are able to join dots that say normal linear people can't. Right. But then the weakness of dyslexia is short-term memory. So my short-term memory is not that good, but my dot joining is excellent. Okay. So you'd have to, you'd have to fill me in on that. Right. So the tweet basically went into the fact I am one third Irish. I am German, English. My grandmother was actually first generation immigrant Brit. And on my maternal side, my great grandmother literally spoke German. So I have some strong roots there in terms of the European side of things. The Irish thing comes from the paternal side of my family on my grandfather's side. And in going back and researching different historical aspects, one of the things that I discovered was that during the early part of the 20th century, going probably through the 1930s and right up to the Second World War, Italians, Irish, and Jews were considered non-white in a white society, which then goes into some very interesting thought patterns about so exactly what is white and exactly how do you parse that against skin color and ethnicity um, racially? And when you go back into history and begin to look at this, you begin to find that these words have pretty specific meanings of what white is. White is not necessarily skin color as much as it is a cultural assimilation into a specific group. And the more I looked at this, I realized that white also meant Christian, and it also, for the most part, meant Protestant. And so looking at my background and realizing that at least one-third of my bloodline, going back to the Irish and the time in which those people entered the country, which was in the late 1800s, I could go back and look at my roots and realize that I identified in some way as a, as a displaced minority in terms of bloodline. Now, it comes into a larger conversation in terms of all of the conversations that are going on around race and ethnicity and all of the different groups that are vying for attention and for equality. And so the tweet fundamentally said, based on my Irish roots, Italians, Jews, 
and Irish were considered non-white. And beg the term here, I'm a nigger too. And I realized when I put that tweet out what a, what a trigger word that is. <laughs> In a lot of ways, it was designed to do exactly that. Because you would look at me and you would go, <laughs> hardly, you're not black. I mean, you're European extraction, that's all true. By extension, what I was doing was framing another conversation that goes into the fact that we're fundamentally being labeled and sorted according to whatever the dominant narrative is at that time. After World War II, which was, Slongman said that wars are a way to bring, out, bring about changes, that revolutions are, are too tedious to do. Wars are how they change us. They move our cultures. After World War II, suddenly the Jews were vying for racial equality, recognizing that they were, if not Caucasian, at least white skinned, the Italians assimilated into the culture, into the, the American melting pot, the Irish the same way. And so that denominative of white, non-white moved away from the European ethnicity and it moved back into the race conversation that was going on first off here in the United States after World War II, leading up to Dr. King and the civil rights movement of the 1960s. So while the text could be seen as offensive, it was my way of framing an argument in another way to go, wait a minute, we've all been labeled. We've all been tagged. We've all been minoritized. We've all been monetized. What's the real slaver culture that's going on here? So that was the means by which you and I kind of came together and you pushed back on that. And I said, you know what? I understand that that's offensive. I deleted the tweet. My look at race, just to make the audience realize that my ethnicity comes from the following countries, Sweden, Scotland, the Republic of Ireland, England, Portugal, Italy, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Barbados, Guyana, and Nigeria. So my family tree, I'm, I think I'm the most diverse person I actually know. But when people look at me, they see a black man. Even though my mother's grand, my mother's mother, my grandmother was a white woman. So what we are in terms of race is we have yet as a species to realize that race is more than just what you see. But for reasons I think maybe of economics, you're white or you're black or you're Asian. And then the other interesting thing is the Asian classification in the UK it is seen generally as somebody from the Indian subcontinent. And the rest of Asia is known as Oriental. But if you went to America and said Asian, that would be for people from the Orient. And then the term Oriental is seen by some as demeaning. So I now personally go on the classification of being mixed heritage because that's what i am i am of mixed heritage some people use dual heritage some people use biracial i don't like that term because i see that as the lgbt community trying to build bridges with race and i think both sexual orientation and race are, are different struggles. They have similarities, but when a person who is white walks into a supermarket or a designer clothes store, for example, that security member of staff might just glance and look away. But if I went into the same store, that security guard might likely follow me. And races in built and Dick Gregory, when he was alive, he yeah. would he would purchase um, research 
study papers from universities. It would cost them between $3,000 and $10,000 to obtain these papers, these academic papers. And he was talking in an interview, and I believe it's called Black Tree Media, and you can get that channel on YouTube. And Dick Gregory, when he was alive, was saying that for advertising and marketing, he was showing people, different people, being smiling, aggressive with facial expressions. And they found that the brainwaves kept acting in a negative way throughout all participants. And what they narrowed it down to was when those participants saw a black person on the screen, be it them smiling, be it them aggressive, different hairstyles, ages, all the participants' fear receptors suddenly fired. And then they found that the darker in complexion the black person, the greater the fear was in all participants. And that was even in black people looking at black people. So this is the notion of race and this is how it works on maybe a genetic level. So it's very interesting race. There's things that trigger me and because I read and because I'm aware of the manipulation that has been put on us courtesy of Edward Bernays and courtesy of Ayn Rand especially, they're, they're the two I would say architects of our current age. So I have to sometimes check myself because I can sometimes easily get into this very binary black and white type of um, conversation. Wow, we're going to begin with unpacking that. Um, so what you pointed out to me both in, in, our, in our messages back and forth on Twitter and what you just relayed, the fact that a black man walking into the store triggers a certain response, specifically, let's say, with a security guard in the store how you will be followed, how you will be under suspicion simply by virtue of the fact that you have black skin, that you're identified as being black. And I would not disagree with that at all because I've seen it. I've seen that racism, and I'll tell you where it comes from. None of this is genetic. If we stripped ourselves back to simply being human beings, if we can remember who we were as children, that doesn't exist. This is, this is cultural programming. And I'll give you the example. Memory of being four years old, I grew up in an all-white community, a very small town in southern central Pennsylvania, a railroad town. Now, I never saw black people, frankly, <clears throat> in my own town except for people who cleaned my grandparents' house. When I was about four years old, I went to a playground with my grandmother in the city. We probably were shopping for the day because she used to take me on trips. We went to a playground. There was a, a sandbox there, and there was a small black girl playing in the sandbox, and I went over because she had a shovel and a bucket and started to play with her. And my grandmother came over and pulled me out of the sandbox and walked me away and said, we do not play with them. That was the moment I remember going in my little subconscious mind, which did not have all of the necessary reference points knowing that there was something wrong with this, knowing somehow inside of me, I have the memory of looking back at that little girl and seeing her face and her sensing what was going on, of how in that moment there was this cultural clash that occurred in a way that played out on a very individual level. And it was the moment when somewhere inside of me something triggered, something started to question. Not rationally, emotionally, in a connective point to, to question this. And it took, it took me until I saw Dr. King and the civil rights movement and realized that these are human beings. 
and how visceral that really is in terms of recognizing our differences really are skin deep. Well, I view things from a different angle. I, I, I'm not dismissing what you went through. That's very powerful. But one of the things I personally believe in is two things. First of all, reincarnation. And the other thing is epigenetics and the fact that you, we've seen a number of athletes, sports stars, who then produce children who follow into their footsteps. And the children have that just that X factor, what mm -hmm. the French calls you to say quoi, just that thing. Yeah, it's like Tiger Woods. I mean, uh, as an example of, of, of somebody who in the sports world was clearly raised to be what he is. I mean, basketball players, football players. Yeah, but then there's then there's length, there's legacy, and you could have a, a very successful pro athlete, and then their child follows their footsteps, and you can see that the gene has been passed on. So it's not universal, but I do believe in them two factors. I'm a very strong believer in reincarnation. That when we die, we just don't. That's it. I believe there's something going on. There's an evolutionary basis to it, but it's linked with a spiritual core where what we have to do as a species is we have to reincarnate and some of the essences and some of the rights and the wrongs are linked with us until we can get to a spiritual understanding. So it's very, my, my philosophy is a bit Eastern, a bit Buddhist, a bit Hindu maybe because I was brought up in a very diverse part of the UK. So I have experienced different religions, spiritual beliefs from a very early age. So I think that racism is definitely taught, but I do believe that it's also nature versus nature. It's like a combination of the two. And I think um, that's where race comes from and, and racial tension and dynamics and, and things such as that. One of the things I observe being somebody who is of mixed heritage, I see with white people, or if you want to say people who would look at as white, I see they are very good at resolving disputes. So if two white people were in an argument, they can quickly um come to an understanding and work together. Black people, on the other hand, can be very, very argumentative and can continue the argument, sometimes to their own negative detriment, where they actually just don't burn bridges, they obliterate them. And I was looking into that, I was like, where's this come from? And again, it's simple human evolution. In Africa, when human beings were starting Homo sapiens, it's tropical weather, it's T-shirt weather. So if you have a tribe of people, you can argue with them and you can say, right, I don't like this tribe anymore. I'm going off somewhere else into the savannah and I'm going to start my own thing. But Europe has very harsh winters. So if it's in the middle of the winter, and everybody is in a cave round the fire, you have to get on with everybody because the alternative is you'll get expelled by the group and you'll be in that blizzard and you'll die. So this is where I see where the racial things come from. So it's, it, even though black people are up, the African diaspora is all over the world, they still have them core traits. And that is... That is the essence of what we are. It all goes back to that beginning. So that's why I believe in that epigenetics and that genetic system, genetic culture. So this, is, this kind of goes into racial memory in one sense of what flows through our DNA largely being sort of a database of the collective memory and the racial memory, the, the racial identity that goes back into we'll say the tribal aspect of it. Interesting. And another thing, I'll bring it modern now, 
into a couple of weeks ago. The rapper Jay-Z made a deal with the NFL that he is now to become the technical director of halftime shows for Super Bowls. So the African-American community came out in utter outrage because the, there's been a big issue with American football players during the anthem taking the knee in um, protest against the lie, what they believe what America is, the pomp and, and, and majesty of what goes on in NFL games, the whole nation, that all, the whole notion that all men are created equal. So by, <laughs> do, by doing that, they were actually making a political statement. So one of the footballers, a man by the name of Colin Kaepernick, pardon yep. the pun, has been blacklisted um, from playing in the NFL. So now Jay-Z's made a deal with the NFL. A lot of the African-American community is seeing him as a traitor. <laughs> I see Jay-Z as actually in some way recognising that the NFL it ain't going nowhere. And what this argument needs to do, it needs to evolve and change. So we've had the Kaepernick incident, we've had the controversy. Now the dynamic has to change where Jay-Z has to be part of that organisation at a senior level, get their trust, change how they do things, and eventually they will give in the New York Jets and he will become the first African-American owner of an American football sure. team where 85% of the players that play the game are black. So he is trying to change it from the inside. But because, again, as I've said, black people have this passion and have this... But, but let me ask you this. What do you think, what do you think Jay-Z is really going to change? First well, off, First off, you know... You don't get to be an NFL owner by virtue of anything except that you sit at the high table. And that high table has to do with the Masonic Circle, which we know Jay-Z has taken oaths for that. I mean, look, Jay-Z's been out there for a long time. He runs all of the symbolism. And I don't really have a problem so much with Jay-Z in the NFL as I do the concept of the NFL in the first place, because frankly, the biggest commodity that the NFL has are very large, very fast, very strong black men who populate their team, who are owned by their team, by the way, under contract, which is why the kneeling at the playing of the national anthem, which isn't <laughs> how far down the rabbit hole do we want to go? The national anthem was written by a Brit. It's not American at all. The flag's not American. It's just, it's, it's basically a derivative form of the Union Jack. And so the playing of the national anthem and the kneel down, these guys, the, the argument is these guys are taking the knee. What they're effectively doing is this is just a dialectic argument. Because in truth of the matter, everybody on that field is under contract to the NFL. They're owned by the owners. They are now going to change the name of the owners of these sports teams because they suddenly went, oops, that sounds a little like slavery to us, doesn't it? The owners. The NFL is, is, is largely a white man's game. It's a, I don't get it. I mean, I'm not a big sports fan. And truthfully, I don't find all that much intrigue in watching people chase a, a silly ball around the field. I get the proudness behind it. But at the end of the day, what it is, it's, it's an entertainment franchise that owns the rights to sell and syndicate a form of entertainment just like Disney, just like MGM, just like all the big movie studios do, just like the record companies have done. You know, I look at athletes as no different than the black artists who were ripped off for their music, uh, blues artists, Screaming Jay Hawkins, um, Muddy Waters, B.B. King, all these musicians were used, they were stolen from. I mean, rock and roll was built on the bones of the, of the blues music. 
And so to me, football is just one stage where this plays out. And so, you know, for me, Jay-Z wouldn't be my first choice of somebody as, as to change things from the inside because he's a consummate insider. And I don't think football is going to evolve all that much in anything beyond what it really is. But it, you, you, I mean, your point's well taken. But really what it is, honestly, it's tokenism. It's representation on one level that invests people into it because there's, it's a marketing strategy. So that's just my take on, on that whole thing. Well, what I look at it in response is that, as you said, a lot of these owners sit at the high table of other organizations, Council for Foreign Relations, Rand Corporation, Lindenberg, Bohemian Grove, UN, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one of the things that I would like is if they do have a eugenics idea to maybe to use a pop culture reference to Thanos the entire half of the world's population or a significant part of it, I would prefer it to be maybe a bit more selective than just let's get rid of all the blacks. I would like it more like that. <laughs> so maybe I, by having somebody black in that role, as evil as it is, it might sort of say, all right, then we won't do it because they're not all useless. So I'm just looking at it in that type of way because what my fears is, again, based on research, was around the SARS epidemic that occurred and it was particularly targeting Oriental people. And what occurred according to various rumours on forums, in the alternative media, and also out of translated newspapers in China, was that the then head of China, the, the president, asked his ambassador to America to speak with somebody senior in the NSA. And it was told to them that if the NSA didn't come with the cure to SARS, that it would eventually lead to the Chinese government declaring it to be a bioweapon <coughs> and then World War Three would start. So what occurred was the, um, suddenly not a cure was found, but the levels of SARS suddenly decreased. And now you hear nothing about SARS. And the whole reason this came about, this understanding by the Chinese, was they looked at the city of Toronto in Canada, which is one of the most diverse metropolitan mm -hmm. locations mm -hmm. on the planet. Yep. And they saw that the only non Oriental people that were getting SARS in large numbers were those that worked in the emergency services. So then they realised that ultimately it was a disease designed to lessen their people and their population. So these sinister things come about, you know, that there was the, the Tungisi experiment that happened in your country where black men that were serving in the military... Tuskegee Institute, yeah. Yep. Yeah, with deliberately... The syphilis. They basically syphilis. injected them with syphilis. And the most horrifying yeah. documentary I've ever seen is around African-American children around about the same time, the 1950s and 60s. They were deliberately interacted with highly enriched uranium because the American government wanted to see how the human body would interact with high doses of radioactive, radioactive material. So a lot of these people are living with severe deformities. So the wickedness and the planning of humans is without doubt. My last point on this is, is Hitler was afraid of Churchill Churchill was afraid of Stalin, and Stalin was afraid of Chairman Mao. So Chairman Mao and Stalin, shortly after World War II, are having a conversation, and Chairman Mao broaches the idea that both nations should fire as many thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs as possible, 
and have their populations live underground because once the dust settles, they'll be the last two nations standing. And Mao Zedong said this to Stalin whilst they were eating lunch. So Stalin just couldn't believe what he was hearing and he refused to take the offer, thankfully. But this is the insanity of leaders and an ultimate power. So I'm sure that with all the environment um, hysteria going on, this 16-year-old Swedish girl nobody's heard of, whose parents are elite opera singers. Greta Thunberg. Yeah, she's yeah. going around the world. She's yep. called celeb. I wouldn't be surprised if they, within their think tanks, are talking about the possibility of a mass, a mass extinction event. And maybe this is why Disney has maybe brought out this whole Avengers thing with a villain who is a eugenicist who wishes to get rid of half of all living things in the universe as a means of sustaining life in the universe. So I don't know if that's them revealing the method. Well, you basically just them. described the plot line of the Avengers of X-Men. I mean, what are mutants? Where do mutants come from? They weaponize the imagery even in our minds with comic books, with entertainment. These concepts are, are slipstreamed into the culture via entertainment. They're just they're memes that they implant there. I mean, they, they, they basically tested nuclear weapons against the people of all nations. But here in the United States, they put off enormous amounts of, of, of uh, hydrogen bombs after, after the Second World War, the H-bombs testing them in the deserts out out in arizona and new mexico and they planted nukes right in our backyards by building these these power plants i mean i live near the most uh, first or second arguably most famous failure of a nuke plant three mile island literally 10 miles to my rear here to the southeast is Three Mile Island. I lived here when Three Mile Island happened. They have tested all manner of diseases on people, SARS, AIDS, um, Zika virus. They've weaponized all of this stuff as a means to test the resiliency of specific classes of populations. And you're right, Toronto is ground zero because Toronto is very mixed. That's the whole point of testing these things in dense populations, is you can run statistical abstracts very quickly through the medical system. So people, I'm sorry, audience, if we're depressing you, but this is the real world. This is the world that we listen to, because one of the things I like to do with my research is I try to get friends who just want to live in their own hedonistic bubble and just want to be happy with their family and themselves and their careers. And every night they just want to close the windows and they don't want to see what's out there. But every now and again, a global event occurs that impacts everybody. And it doesn't matter if you close the curtains or not, it's going to come for you. So it's better that you're more prepared for it, even on an intellectual basis then ignore it completely. So for those that have seen this on my Facebook page, you are friends of mine, and it's making them more depressed, this is the world that we're living in, and the only way we can change it is by having dialogues with people that we've just met, maybe people that we might never meet, using this great thing known as technology to enlighten and inspire the world. Yeah. So let's zip through some of these topics, because what we do here is we have one hour, and this will be the hour that goes public on YouTube that everybody's going to see. So maybe we can compress some of these topics a little bit. The second hour will be what we call the woo-woo hour. That'll be the deep stuff that, that uh, our subscribers on Patreon see, and that's kind of uh, the contours of the interview. But one of the things that you wanted to go into, and I'm looking at your list here, um, Brexit, Britannia, Prince Andrew, the main event, and Jeffrey Epstein, actually alive yet, and why? Can, can we, like, clip through some of that 
All right, so I'll give you the main... Uh, I'll, I'll be honest right now. I do not understand Brexit. I'm an American. And quite honestly, I don't think Americans understand Brexit at all. Mm. Well, here's the abstract. There is the synopsis of it. Prince Andrew, since leaving the military, has been in, involved as a trade envoy for the United Kingdom. He is the Queen's favourite child. He has the closest relationship of all the Queen's children to her. And the Queen, it has been said by various news organisations in the UK, has no love for the European Union. She sees it as actually diluting her power within her own nation and her legacy of her family's legacy. So much so that in Sandringham two years ago, maybe Christmas 2016, 2017, she asked her family, can somebody tell me why the EU is necessary for the UK to be part of? And nobody gave her at the table a coherent answer to why the UK should still be part of the European Union. So what has occurred since Brexit? Prince Andrew has been noted that he will be the lead to get new trade deals for the UK. So much so that he even told, I believe, the Associated Press earlier this year in 2019 that if paraphrasing that if those politicians can't get it together we will which means the royal family will now get into the game of trade deals and geopolitics which is something they haven't done for a number of centuries to an overt obvious level so prince philip has a a regular thing at buckingham palace known as pitch at the palace in which entrepreneurs with ideas give a business plan to um, this website. It gets vetted, and then you then get invited to Buckingham Palace, and you have a five-minute pitch in front of Prince Andrew and the sort of heads of industry, captains of industry from the UK and around the world, most probably outside the European Union. So what has occurred now is that the Metropolitan Liberal political wealth, they've invested in slave, slave labour in China. So they need China to make things um, as fast as they can, for as cheap as they can, with as little overheads as possible. And then they get these items and they sell them for as much as they can in the Western world. And then they get huge maximum profits what's occurred now britain has now gone out of the eu prince andrew is now trying to make britain be self-sufficient the chinese communist party in my speculation have gone to this cabal of politicians of leaders of industry who are globalists and they've said and they've told them if you don't try to get rid of andrew He's then going to make Britain be successful. Then Britain then is obviously going to look to emerging markets such as the Philippines, such as Vietnam, such as Burma, and even the reintroduction of industrializing Africa, notably West Africa, that is severely currently underdeveloped. So this changes the dynamics. So the EU linked with the Chinese they need Andrew out the game. So the only way you can get Andrew out the game is by bringing this Epstein thing up. There's a lot of collateral damage that's going to have to take place to get Andrew out the game, but they're prepared for that. And they're also trying to carry to assassinate Trump due to Trump's previous partying with Andrew and Epstein. Whereas we know Epstein and Trump fell out due to a property issue in the in Miami, Palm Beach area. So that's the synopsis of it. Prince Andrew needs, is like a chess piece on the chessboard and they need... Of course he is. Of course he is. He's a high-end chess piece. But, you know, it's not lost on me. Here's the British Empire, upon which the sun supposedly never set at one time. 
who up until the Boer War effectively were the major dominant empire coming out of, out of Europe. And what happened as the sun began to set on the British Empire for the first time were two world wars that involved England with other European states plus the dynamic of bringing the Japanese in during World War II. And how after the settlement of World War II, the entire axis shifted to the United States, which became the dominant power, not through colonialism, which was the methodology of the British Empire, but through militarism. So I'm looking at this realignment, and the EU goes back to the European common market, which was being fomented in the 60s as a concept to bring the European states together under one currency and one economic system to basically break down trade barriers. What it became, in my view, was an inversion of the typical power structure where the smallest nations, like Belgium, began to drive the narrative to the larger, wealthier nations with Germany sitting at the top and Germany becoming the engine for the EU and Britain, which walked in and did not give up its own currency, did not adopt the euro, sitting there sort of as a second-tier player, watching how not only was their economic well-being declining, but under the EU, you began to see the migration into the European states of what people considered to be no longer immigrants, but simply hordes of people who were coming in as clients of a welfare state. Is that a fair statement? I would say the whole notion is, is that, how can I say this in a, in a really small way? Boris Becker, okay, because I like sports. Boris Becker in his autobiography states that when he won Wimbledon as a 17-year-old, he realised what the true essence of Germany was. And that is in that nation believing they are superior to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And when he was introduced, when, when he would be walking, doing his everyday thing as a 17-year-old after winning that tournament, as an unseeded player, beating men, he was shocked by the amounts of ordinary people who seen that his victory proved that they were somehow genetically superior, so much so that it freaked Boris Becker to such an extent. He now lives in London, so he still visits his homeland, but he has said on a number of occasions he would never relocate to Germany. So what there is, is there is something, and he's a German sporting hero, so if he could say that in his own autobiography, it sort of proves what is going on. Germany also has greater voting rights than any other nation in the European Union. And That's this, true. this is the oxymoron that I tell people that are in, 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 in obsessed or are lovers of the European Union here in the UK. If we're a union, that to me, my definition of a union means equality, means nobody sits at the high table and means that there's no low table. Everybody's on the same level. So how can Germany have more voting rights than France or Italy or Spain or Belarus or, Belarus or Belgium or anyone else? This is, what, this is what I don't like. And the other reason why I'm, I don't like the EU is that it's, again, elitist colonialism. Recently, sure. we've had the EU make a defence trade deal with Vietnam. And the reason why they have made this defence pact with Vietnam is to stop the growth of China. So you have all these metropolitan liberals who were all kumbaya and hipsters and vegans and 
oh, and they have the beards really long and gobby stuff. <laughs> what? And they read the Guardian. They believe the Guardian is the truth, and not one word of that paper is a lie. But when I tell them that the EU is making defence deals with Vietnam, and I show them the evidence of this happening this year. They, they can't respond to me. And then there's another senior EU MEP from Belgium, Guy Vorstadt. I, I, he wears glasses. He's a very famous MEP. And he said earlier this year that the EU needs to get into Africa as a way of halting Chinese economic growth. Now, if that's not a colonialist talking, I don't know what is. So, so this game is, is, is very complex. And the other reason why I believe, going back to the Prince Andrew um, speculation or theory I have, is what was once old becomes new again. So obviously China, with their history with, with the UK, in terms of the opium wars, in terms of the whole thing with the boxer, revolution or the boxer massacre which is something that isn't mm. really talked about within the western world they are afraid that britain will one day rule the waves like the song says so they now worry what will become old will become new so there's all these different power structures all these unholy alliances all these contradictions and the average person just wants to close the curtains and be with the family and, and just turn on the television and get entertained. And when war is declared, then people are, are outraged. So why is this happening? And the reason why it's happening is because the individual didn't take time to have an interest. And all it can take is just put on a Facebook post or and then that can inspire other people, and it snowballs, and then what that does to the power elite that sit at the top table, they realise the power of the majority, so then they modify, they might hold back, they might even suspend their original plans, but it takes personal responsibility to make that happen. So this is the thing. So my whole issue of voting for Brexit was a person who is against colonialism, who realises what is old can become new again. And I don't want a metropolitan version of colonialism to go and infiltrate Africa. And then they then have to tell Africans, well, what we want you to do in Ghana, you have to have a pride celebration every June. And if you do not have a nationwide promotion of pride every June, then we're not having this trade deal. And the same things happen now with Brazil and the Amazon fires that are occurring. The tea shock of the Republic of Ireland, Leo Vadkar, because the president of Brazil said some anti-LGBT statements, he, Vadkar is using the fires as a means of trying to stop the trade agreements between Brazil and the EU. So what now Vadkar is now trying to implement is, well, part of the deal has to be amended where the EU now has to have certain control of the Amazon. And then also Brazil has to implement certain LGBT pro legislation. So this is where we have colonialism coming through. Well, my the understanding of Bra Brazil, is, Brazil has been pretty much very pro-LGBT for a long time. But not and, under this president. Right, right. And see, this is... Okay, so you've brought this up a couple times. First off, I don't make a co-equivalence between LGBT and civil rights. But there is a certain structure here that works. Um, unlike a lot of people... Although I recognize that LGBT has been appropriated, I also recognize that what came out of that movement was a long-term drive, much like civil rights in the United States, to stop discriminating against people of different sexualities. Now, what it's become since is another matter, because once 
once a movement gets to a critical point, it is infiltrated, it is saturated with another agenda, and then it's basically toppled. So if you look at the United States, and you look at the NAACP, which was the forerunner organization for civil rights during the time of uh, the civil rights movement under Dr. Martin Luther King, the NAACP today is effectively diluted to the point where it's worthless. It's not recognized anymore as being a civil rights organization. It's basically now a bookmark in history. I look at the LGBT movement, and it's an amalgamation. And this goes into, by the way, what um, came up in the comedy. Um, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Dick what, Stones. Netflix, Dick, Netflix. Dave Chappelle actually does this quite brilliantly. Because what he says there, in very humorous terms, is an umbrella organization. Those people were all separately individual groups of people with their own needs and requirements simply under an umbrella or the rainbow. So it was an amalgamated organization designed to pull in a bunch of disenfranchised people based on sexuality and gender and then use that movement to drive other narratives. I get that. So... I don't see that as the anchor for most of this other machinations going on in the background in terms of the economics and things like that. What I do see is this constant, at the end of the day, Darren, we're all, we're all assets that are being managed. At the top tier of the world, which has nothing to do with nations, peoples, religions, races, bloodlines, however you want to slice and dice humanity. This is a farming project based on an economic system that they created and which we live under for profit and gain. I mean, I will go as far back as saying that this is historical, that this is off-world, that humanity has been farmed by extraterrestrials, that we have been genetically modified as beasts of burden to serve higher beings. But in fact, we are consciousness invested in human vessels, and therefore we are fundamentally sovereign within ourselves. And so the whole project is constantly realigning. The British Empire, the greatest empire, the Industrial Revolution, colonialism all over the world, and yet it fell. America, the rage of the world from the 1940s to the 1970s, and then all of a sudden the bottom starts to drop out. And we're going to China, we're going to Taiwan, we're going to the Pacific Rim, moving all of our manufacturing out of the country, because we fundamentally cannot support the type of economies that drive Western nations based on our own manufacturing output, our own labor, our own ingenuity. And so it's constantly pushing for the next angle to squeeze another dollar, another pound, another euro, another yen out of an economic system that is exploitive of human capital. Well, one of the things I would like to say, um, because obviously we're in something known as a post-fact, world and that I think was termed by Donald Rumsfeld of all people <laughs> and or was it yeah Donald Rumsfeld not Dick Cheney and what I'm what's meant by that is that people now um, are about emotion they're about what they know combined with emotion and observation so one of the things I want to say is not so much a disclaimer but we're hitting on very touchy subjects that have affected people. Sure, yeah. So I want to say that I am not dismissive of the LGBT community. I have friends who are part of that world who have suffered domestic violence from their parents in the physical form. 
due to their expressions of, of, of things growing up as children where maybe their parents believed they'd done something in public that was inappropriate and then they tried to beat it out of them. So I know people that have been psychologically damaged through this, just through being who they are. But one of the things that I think to crystallise you what you said is that the thing that annoys me here in the UK is the amount of rainbow flags that I see on buildings. And yet, if you went into that bar or you went into that branch of the National Bank, a retail bank, and you asked the manager, what is your LGBT policy? They would just look at you in a blank yeah, stare. Yeah, of course, yeah. I, and, this is, and it's because we're living in a post-facts world. And what is the case? It's emotionalism. It's what you said. It's affinity groups. It's designed to pull out of us emotional energy and invest that over the energy we would put into logically sequencing the facts and details of any particular item. Well, what's, so, ref what's refreshing in the UK now is there's elements of the LGBT community that have come out this year in Pride season, which is June to about mid, mid, mid no, June to about mid-August there in the UK. Yeah, yeah it's and, like that here in the US too. And they've said, well, what are these corporations doing to help us? And they had a prominent a woman who was an intellectual and she was on Sky News and she was talking about how these businesses have absolutely no policy. Some of the businesses that overtly use the rainbow flag don't even give donations to LGBT charities. So this is the, co as you say, this is the co-opting and the Trojan horse techniques that have always been used in groups that have demanded equal and human rights. And the thing that they do is they allow these groups to come into the public sector. Then the, the gravy train is discovered, just like the European So Union. economic, my man. When they found out that gay people had money, they're like, we were down on this. We want to market to these people. The truth of the matter is they've done the same thing with all of us. We're just... We're just you know, we're being mined for our energy. We're being mined for our hearts and our attention into whatever game it is that they're running currently. And I'm no more attached to LGBT than I am anything else. I think the movement's corrupt. I think it's been co-opted. I think it's been marketed. I think in the United States, because I follow this, a lot of gay people have just gone, you know, I go to Pride, and there's all these big banks. Well, where were the big banks back when people were dying of AIDS? Were they helping to do research? Where were these people when we couldn't get jobs or we were fired from jobs for being gay or bisexual or trans? And they're looking at this, and they're starting to factor, yeah, this is a corporate thing, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of is. The most, and, the most hilarious example, if you want to look at it, is Liverpool City Council, in celebration of Pride, decided to use a set of public steps in rainbow colours in an area known as Clayton Square. So the mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson, was on Twitter, in the local media, proud as anything to say that these steps that were part of a shopping centre were in rainbow colours and isn't Liverpool great? And I was like, if that's your level of awareness, like, God help us all, really, he's the mayor of Liverpool. So, so this, is, this is what we have to do, but because going to back to the Chappelle special on Netflix currently, Sticks and Stones, because people uh, into this 
looking to be metropolitan liberal and hip and they don't want the finger being pointed at them racist fascist liar sexist homophobe anti-european conspiracy theorists fake news russian agents russian operative because of all of that people are now in these uh, prisons of their own mind of conformity and what's occurring in britain is it's a race to mediocrity so we're not even having people who uh, uh i really are, like that set a race to mediocrity i like that and this is this is one of the reasons why brexit was voted for because the people that voted for brexit were some of the poorest people in the uk and in my own city some of the highest rates of poverty in the in my city voted for brexit and this city supposedly a metropolitan liberal and very socialist and the reason why these people voted for brexit not because they were racist i'm sure some of them were not because some of them had low education it's because they see the sky is blue and the grass is green and we have had a political establishment on both sides that have agreed to de-industrialize this country we are the only major country in the world that has no vehicle manufacturing base. We have to bring in cars and vehicles from yep. your country, yep. from Europe, from Japan, Germ from, Germany. from I mean, South Korea. You have to be self-sufficient and you have to create your own car vehicle manufacturing base. In France, there's a joke. And the joke is you've got a choice of cars, a Reynolds, a Citroen, or a Peugeot. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Believe me, you do not want to be in a Citroen. And if, um, and if you drive in France, all you see are mechanics who are specialists of them three. Hardly anybody in France will drive any other car because those people have awareness that their friends and their family are linked to that manufacturing base. And if they're not, it's just to be patriotic. So even though France is part of the EU, those people have got a sense of patriotism, but something to do with, I don't know if it's, if it's guilt for some sort of thing with colonialism, that generally white metropolitan liberal people here in the UK feel the need that they must abandon their sense of patriotism. I'm not asking people to wave the flag and love the Queen. I don't love the royal family. But what I'm saying is, is I'm born here and I have to do maybe what Jay-Z's trying to do with the NFL. I've got to try to adapt what is already built to something to make it a bit more attractive and more in line with my ethos and my upbringing. So, so this is this is the reason, this is the things that are going on in this country. People just want to jump on the bandwagon. And when I talk about it, because of my ethnicity, they can't point at me and they can't say you're being racist. Because as I've said, look at my background genetically where I'm from. I'm from at least three continents on this planet. I'm the most diverse person I know. So they can't point that finger at the race card. So when I do talk, they don't know how to deal with it. And they just shut down. They literally shut down like you took the, the plug out of them. So this is what this conversation is trying to do. It is trying to get people out of mediocrity. It is trying to get people to think that there are un- linear things in this world and things are connected that most probably the bbc are not telling you about so so this is it but at the ir ironic thing gchq who the national spy agency of the uk they are actively advertising for people like me who are dyslexic because they know we can see the dots and we can see <laughs> the yes that's actually not a disability it's actually an ability and we can work yeah. with them. So I could join GCHQ and I could be the inverted conspiracy theorist 
So I could actually make conspiracy theories because I know how conspiracy theories work because I can join all these dots. Sure. Well, I mean, the CIA invents them all the time. Exactly. As so, does MI5, I'm, you know, Mossad, they're all running counter operations that involve manufacturing conspiracy theories. That's, that's the tripwire to really what we're doing here is a lot of what we talk about is being weaponized against us. Well, for, I don't know how we are for time because you did say this is our one. Yeah. You want to go into reparations? Well, how are we for time? Because I wanted to, all the people on the freebie section. Okay. You go where you want to go, brother. Um, this is a great YouTube channel. It is called Off Planet Media. Um, they deal with people all over the world on all various subjects and topics. I advise that everybody looks at their extensive YouTube archive, which is very thought-provoking, which has a lot of very interesting stories. But the core that what makes Off Planet special is it's about people and it is about looking at the human condition and looking at the individuality of guests involved. So please look at not only this interview, please look at their excellent um, archive on YouTube. If you'd like to talk to me, I do the Twitter. My Twitter is Daz Alt Fairy, all one word. That is fairy as in science, not as in Tinkerbell. Um, if you <laughs> wish, in the description below this it's YouTube below. page, yes. um, there will be links to my Twitter page. And also, again, hopefully, Randy, you can put a link to that Sister Kerry Bunmore interview that I would like um, everybody after this to watch. It has no connection to this interview, but it's a prime example of what this excellent station does. Well, I really appreciate you doing that, Taryn. That was awesome. Yeah, so all the information is down there in the little text box that y'all sometimes don't bother reading, but it's there anyway. And you can contact Darren, you can contact us. This is Off Planet Radio. We're going to flip over to the patron site if you uh, want some of that. It's not a lot. I'm just asking maybe three or four bucks to jump in and uh, get the full effect. This is Off Planet Radio signing off for the public side. We're going to join our supporters. See you on the other side. Bye.